Hey everybody, glad to be back with you. I hope that you're having a wonderful day today. Uh, today uh, we are going to what might be the last uh, strictly YouTube uh, broadcast uh, quarantine lesson. Uh, we're going to continue talking about the series that we started last week, uh, You Shall Love Your Neighbor. Uh, that uh, comes from what Jesus says was the uh, second greatest commandment. Of course, the first one being, uh, being to, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, uh, and uh, to love your neighbor as yourself being the second one. And so uh, we're going to continue discussing that uh, tonight. Uh, it's been a, a pretty wild couple of weeks. Uh, I know uh, the year 2020 has turned out to be uh, quite a, uh, an interesting year to say the least. Uh, we started off having a lot of political turmoil, then we had a lot of other political turmoil, and then we've had uh, the medical uh, issues with the coronavirus, and then we've had uh, the, uh, the, the discrimination issues, the racial issues with the death of George Floyd. Uh, we've had riots, we've had protests, uh, we've had a lot of death and murder and mayhem in uh, various parts of the country. Uh, thankfully for those of us who are in the uh, Baton Rouge and New Orleans areas. Most everything has been peaceful, uh, no major problems, no major, major issues there, um, but a whole lot going on and a lot of things that are putting us at odds with our, uh, our neighbors, if you will. Lots of things that are causing us to think about uh, the way we've done things before, the way we're gonna continue doing things moving forward. Uh, lots of uh, questions being asked as to how far do we go in making accommodations, corrections, changes, uh, do I need to make a change? Do other people need to make changes? If so, what kinds of changes? Uh, how, how much change? How, how fast do we need to make these changes? All kinds of questions that are flying around right now, especially when it comes to interpersonal issues, uh, particularly regarding race. And, uh, and so we started this series last week uh, talking about uh, loving our neighbor as ourselves. And of course, uh, you know, Jesus uh, talked to uh, this lawyer uh, t uh, discussing the question about what commands that uh, the lawyer needed to follow in order to inherit eternal life. Later, Jesus is asked, in other instances, Jesus asked what the greatest commandment is. Uh, and so everything centers around love. It centers around loving God, and it centers around loving our neighbor. And in fact, Paul tells us that on these two commands hang the law of prophets. Uh, so these are extraordinarily important things for us to think about, uh, important things for us to talk about. But one of the questions that was asked uh, during this conversation that Jesus had with the lawyer was, who is my neighbor? Now, this is a very profound question. Uh, a lot of times we kind of push these questions aside and we focus on, uh, on other parts of the parable and, and things along those lines. But uh, Jesus has asked this question for a reason and he gives the, the answer that he gives for a reason. It's kind of like when uh, Pontius Pilate asks Jesus, what is truth? Uh, Jesus talked about the truth. Uh, setting people free in John chapter 8. Later, uh, Pilate asks Jesus, what is truth? And so there are a lot of uh, uh, very powerful uh, questions concerning uh, the nature of God, the nature of life, and, and all these different things. And, and this question of who is my neighbor is a very important, a very powerful question that we need to ask and we need to answer. And we're going to end up in the book of Jonah a little bit later on. So we're going to see uh, how this has a bearing uh, as we tie it back to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Again, we, uh, we read this last week. We talked about this last week from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Uh, the lawyer is asking Jesus these questions in order to try to justify himself. He wants to say uh, to himself, he wants to say to the people around him, he wants to say to Jesus, I am a good person. I am doing what is right. Uh, I am justified. I'm found in compliance with the law is exactly what that word justified means. He wants to be found in compliance with the law. He wants to be uh, able to say, God, I've done enough. I need to have eternal life. I have earned my eternal life. And so he asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? Uh, when, uh, when the guy says, uh, in response to Jesus' question, uh, how does he read the law? What does it say? He says, love God and love your neighbor. Jesus says, you're right, do these uh, and you shall live. So the, uh, the lawyer asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus turns around and he tells of the Samaritan. Uh, we understand this parable to be the parable of the Good Samaritan. 
Uh, and, and we see that in this parable uh, this idea that the Samaritan is, is acting in appropriate in an appropriate manner. Uh, and so it's important for us to really look at this parable and to really examine why it was so powerful, just kind of by way of reminder. And so at the end of the parable, Jesus asks the Samaritan, or uh, asks the lawyer, who proved to be the neighbor, who proved to, to really show that neighborly love uh, and that compassion for their fellow man. Remember, the parable is of of a Jew who's traveling uh, to Jericho, he gets attacked, he gets left on the side of the road for dead. Uh, the Levite passes by, the priest passes by, neither one of them help, but the Samaritan helps. And so Jesus asks who proved to be the neighbor. And uh, the answer to the question was the one who showed him, the, the victim of the crime, mercy. Now, what's extremely interesting about this is that Jesus is not the one who, who comes to that conclusion by himself, really, uh, it's the lawyer. The lawyer comes to the conclusion that the neighbor is the one who showed the mercy. And so uh, deductive reasoning, the way Jesus teaches, kind of brings this guy full circle all the way back around to him understanding who is the one who is being the neighbor, happens to be the Samaritan. Now, why did Jesus choose the Samaritan as the hero of the parable. There are lots of different ways Jesus could have gone, gone about teaching this and taught the exact same lesson. So we have to ask the question, why did Jesus choose the Samaritan? What is so significant? What is so important about having the Samaritan at the center of this story? Now Jesus asks questions uh, and he points things out. Sometimes they're details, but most of the time it's something that's either very familiar uh, the people would understand the reference. The reference is extremely important. Uh, sometimes the reference is a tipping point. It's a, it's a hot button issue, if you will, for the people to whom Jesus is speaking. And this happens to be the case. The Samaritan is a hot topic for the, for the Jews at that day and time because there's a significant history along with the Samaritans. Now, you're going to see something very interesting as we go because the Samaritans tie back to the Assyrians who tie back to the work of the prophet Jonah, which is where we're going to end up here for most of the rest of this lesson. So we see the history of the Samaritans. So uh, Assyria invaded Israel, and this would be the northern kingdom of Israel. Remember, by this point in, in history, uh, Israel had split from Judea, and so you had the northern and the southern kingdoms. And Assyria had invaded the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 B.C. Now, there was a long history of, of issues between Assyria and Israel before this point, before 721, because the work of Jonah happens quite a bit before this, but we'll get into that in just a minute or two. So Assyria invades Israel in 721 BC. Now, while they were there, they took a lot of people captive. They, they took a lot of, of prisoners uh, uh, to, to enslave them, to transport them, to, to do whatever they were gonna do with them. So they deported these people to other regions. Uh, we see this happening also with the Babylonians. Uh, we know that uh, the Judea was taken, or Judah was taken into captivity by the Babylonians with the uh, incursion of Nebuchadnezzar into Jerusalem. And so, you know, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego all end up in, uh, in Babylon because of this. So this was something that was very common. People would come, they would raid, they would invade, they would take uh, people captive, they would keep them hostage uh, to ensure cooperation by the people back in the land. Uh, they would take them and incorporate them into their own uh, palaces, into their own kingdoms. They would enslave them for, for labor. Lots of things that were going on here. And so we see this happen uh, uh, to Israel by Assyria as well. So 721 and down, uh, you know, uh, uh, several, uh, several more years beyond that, where they were taking these people captive, making various incursions into Israel. But Assyria also had a way to kind of keep the, uh, their, uh, their uh, dominated regions under control. Not only would they remove some of the locals, they would also bring in other people from various parts of their empire. The Assyrian Empire extended a pretty good bit across the Middle East, uh, of what we would call, uh, you know, all the way from uh, 
from Samaria, uh, from Turkey, Damascus, uh, Syria, all those areas, almost all the way across to uh, what's modern day Iraq. Uh, until the Babylonians got a hold of them in about 684. That's, a, that's another story for another time. And so as they conquered these areas, they would bring captives from those areas and kind of transplant them, uh, remove some, and transplant other people there. And so you had a, a mixture of folks who ended up in the northern part of Israel. And so the people intermingled with the Jews, but they were never really accepted as fully Jewish. Uh, it's a terrible uh, connotation to the phrase half-breed, uh, but that is really how the Jews viewed the Samaritans at that point in time. That is a, that is a really significant racial slur uh, in, a lot of, uh, in a lot of areas and a lot of capacities. And that is something that the Jews viewed uh, the Samaritans as being. They weren't really quite Jewish. And so there were a lot of divisions among the people, mostly along racial and ethnic lines. Uh, and so the Jews considered themselves a, a separate ethnicity, considered themselves a separate race. And so there was a lot of division amongst those racial lines. Now, this animosity persisted for centuries. It starts in the 700s B.C., and we see Jesus talking about it in about 30 A.D. Uh, and so uh, several hundred years, 700 years perhaps, uh, 600, 700 years perhaps, we see this problem of division cropping up between the Jews and their, their distant relatives, if you will, the Samaritans who were just to the north of them. And so this animosity persisted for centuries, but it all goes back to a fight between two groups of people back 700 years before the time of Jesus. And this leads us to the history and the story of Nineveh, which leads us to Jonah. And so we see that the Assyrians and the Jews were very, very bitter enemies for almost 200 years. Years uh, we see uh, the, the Assyrians attacking Israel in the uh, in the late 700s BC, uh, uh, almost 800 BC down through 700 BC, all the way down into about the 600s when the Babylonians took uh, took them out, basically came in and destroyed the Assyrians, and so they were bitter enemies for almost 200 years, not quite, but almost 200 years, and the Assyrians committed horrible, horrible war crimes against the people of Israel. And so uh, we oftentimes think of the death and the destruction and the mistreatment of man against man uh, in modern times. We think of modern wars and, and all of the problems that we have and, and, and pain that we have inflicted upon one another of uh, dislocating people and internments and, uh, and, and the, the Jewish Holocaust. We think of all those things. Those things aren't new to the treatment of man against man. This is something that was, has been going on uh, since uh, the fight with Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4. Uh, and so we see these very horrible war crimes uh, that the Assyrians commit against the people of Israel. And the Jews hated the Assyrians for it. Um, and I do not use the word hate here lightly. Uh, some people want to say that the biblical definition of the word hate means to love someone less. That's not this. Uh, that's not what we're talking about here. They're, they despised the Assyrians. They hated them. They hated them to their very core because of what the Assyrians had done to the Israelites during the course of these conflicts. And so when we go to the book of Jonah, uh, we see in Jonah chapter 1, uh, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, uh, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. And so, again, this was before the worst of the worst of, uh, of Assyria's uh, war crimes against Israel. Um, they had done some pretty horrific things by this point in history. Uh, and uh, early 700s A.D., if you will, uh, somewhere between 796 and 756 uh, A.D. is when this, uh, is when Jonah would have, um, would have prophesied. And so the word of the Lord comes to Jonah, and he's told to go to Nineveh, this great city, this big city, this, this powerful city. Uh, great here is not a moral standard. Great here is a standard of physical presence, uh, whether it's size, population, population, 
military might. Uh, it is a great city. Now, Nineveh, being the capital of the Assyrian Empire, is not just standing in for the city, it's standing in for the empire. And so um, even though God is zeroing in on the city here, he's really talking a lot about the entire empire of, of Assyria. But Nineveh being the capital, of course, is the stand-in and the, the target, the focal point of either God's wrath or God's mercy. But he also says here that their evil has come up uh, before him. And so God knows what Assyria is up to. God is not blind to the, the crimes that they've committed, uh, to the atrocities that they've committed. And so he is going to send Jonah to Nineveh to preach against them. Now, let's talk about Jonah here for a second or two because Jonah is, um, as one of my college professors told me one time, a good, bad example. Uh, and so we see a lot of things uh, that happen with Jonah are, are a great example of what not to do, or as we'd say, a good, bad example, right? And so Jonah knew that the Assyrians were evil. There was no question about it. He knew it. He understood it. He hated them for it. Um, everything was wrong with them. Uh, he he uh, knew what they had done to Israel. He was aware uh, of the war crimes that they had committed. He is aware of the slaughter. He's aware of the captivities. He's aware of all of those things. And, and again, Jonah hated Assyria for this. But he also knew that God's call to repentance for them was sincere. He knew when God called to them and said, hey, uh, come, uh, come out of your evil, repent of your evil, and turn back again to what's right. He knew that God meant what he said. And when God has extended uh, the offer of penitence to someone, he also knew that God was extending them the offer to be spared. And Jonah did not like that. More details on that here in just a few minutes. But Jonah did not like the idea that Nineveh could possibly be spared. He didn't like the idea of them getting any of God's mercy. He didn't like the idea of them receiving any of God's grace. He didn't want salvation or even just a temporary stay on justice for the Assyrians. He wanted God to destroy them. He wanted God to punish them. But God being God, God being merciful, God being full of grace, is ready to extend, even to this most wicked group of people, some type of reprieve for a punishment against their sins. And so we see in verse 3 of Jonah chapter 1, the first part of verse 3, says, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish. We believe Tarshish was uh, Spain, the other end of the Mediterranean. Uh, from the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. Now, we know most of the story here, right? We, we know the story. Jonah gets on the boat. The boat puts out to sea. They run into a storm. Uh, the sailors on the boat are, are freaking out, as they should have been, because they, they recognize that the storm that they're in is not natural. And they're trying to figure out what's going on. They tell Jonah, hey, uh, you're one of those Israelites. Pray to your God that he may spare us. Jonah says, look, I'm, I'm responsible here. Just throw me overboard. Uh, you'll live. Maybe I'll die, but you guys will live. And, and maybe Jonah was thinking, I'll sink to the bottom of the sea. And I still won't have to go to them. Uh, but, but God had other plans. So uh, we know about the fish. We know about the three days. We know about Jonah being spit back up on shore uh, and uh, making his way into Nineveh and proclaiming the message that God had sent him to proclaim. But we see overall, Jonah did not want God to spare the city of Nineveh. Again, we talked about this a second ago, but it, it, really, it really needs to be emphasized. There were differences there were differences between the Assyrians and the Israelites. There were, there were vast differences. They were a different country. They had different values. They worshiped different gods. Um, Israel was a small, uh, a small kingdom that didn't have much military might. Assyria at that point was at the height of their power. Uh, they were able to just kind of go around at will uh, between, uh, between the time of uh, you know, of, of the Egyptians being much more powerful and the Babylonians being much more powerful, Assyria kind of came to a peak at that point. Um, and so they exercised that power. They did a lot of damage. And Jonah did not want to see them spared. 
he hated these people. He hated every single one of them. He hated everything that they stood for. He hated everything that was associated with them. And he wanted them destroyed. He wanted them destroyed. He didn't want to see them live. He didn't want to see them repent. He didn't want to see them shown mercy. And his hatred almost kept him from preaching the word of God. Now, had it not been for God's intervention in the life of Jonah, had it not been for God's uh, sending of the storm, preparing the, uh, the fish, uh, having the sailors throw Jonah overboard, having the fish uh, keep him uh, for three days until Jonah finally learned his lesson, Jonah was, did not really have a change of heart in this case. And this is something that's very important for us to keep in mind. Jonah did not have a change of heart, and we see that all the way through the entire book of Jonah. The most successful preacher, the most successful prophet that we see say Jesus himself didn't want to go preach, and he didn't have a love for the people to whom he was going to preach. In fact, he wanted to see them dead. And had it not been for the divine intervention and God divinely teaching him a lesson, he wouldn't have gone at all. His hatred almost kept him from preaching the word of God. His hatred would have prevented him from doing the right thing. I think part of the lessons that we can learn here is that we can't allow hatred to get in our way. Even if it's undercover, even if it's disguised, even if we don't think uh, it's there, we have to examine ourselves to see where, uh, where that hatred may have taken root, where those evil thoughts have taken root. And we have to come uh, to an understanding and knowledge and a realization of those things and purge them and get them out of the way. We're told throughout the New Testament to lay malice aside because it will prevent us from being the right kind of Christians uh, and, and pleasing to our God. And so his hatred almost keeps him from preaching the word of God. And we jump to chapter 3 and verse 6, and we read, once Jonah gets this idea, uh, we see in, in chapter 1, Jonah's running from God. Uh, we see in chapter 2, Jonah comes to terms with God. Uh, we see in chapter 3, Jonah preaches the word of God. And look at the reaction. Look at the response in the city of Nineveh to the word of God being brought by Jonah. It says, the word reached the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Now, these are all signs of mourning. These are all signs that he was distressed by the message of Jonah. Jonah shows up, 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. He does this for a couple of days. He walks around the entire city. He proclaims this message. He's untouched while he's preaching this message. Apparently, word gets back to the king. Uh, we see that here. And the king understands the severity of the message. There's something going on with Jonah that brings very, uh, very clear attention uh, and very clear understanding to the message that he's preaching. And so the king, of course, here repents. We see this penitence. We see him uh, commanding that the entire city repent and, and, and doing so so that just maybe the God of Israel will spare the city of Nineveh. And he does. God spares the city. He sees his penitence. He sees the king's penitence. He sees the city's penitence. And he decides that he was going to spare the city of Nineveh from the destruction that he's promised. Now we go back to Jonah. We see here with Jonah that the city of Nineveh did repent. Great Great, we would say, fantastic, I've preached the word of God. They've heard the word of God. They've accepted the word of God, and they have responded accordingly. This is great, right? No. <laughs> Jonah became very angry. He didn't want to go to those people over there. He didn't want to preach God's message of grace and mercy to those people over there. And when he was forced to, and he was forced to. And he didn't go willingly. Make no mistake about that. When he was forced to and they accepted, he became mad. And God asks Jonah a question. Chapter 4, verse 4, he asks Jonah, Do you do well to be angry? Now, I've looked at this passage 
I, I couldn't tell you how many times over my, over my life as a Christian I've looked at this passage from Jonah. I couldn't tell you how many times I've seen this and, and see God asking Jonah this rhetorical question of, you know, why are you mad? What's, what's got you so upset? But he asks him, do you do well to be angry? Now, of course, uh, Jonah says, yes. It's right for me to be angry. And then later, when, when God gives him a plant for the shade to, to help him with the heat, and the plant dies, and Jonah's mad again, and, and, Jonah, and God asks Jonah one more time, do you do well to be angry? And he says, yes, I do well to be angry, even to the point of death. God, I would have rather died than to see these people uh, repent. I would have rather died than to see them saved. And I had my plant, and my plant's dead, and now I'm mad because my plant's dead. I'm mad because my plant's dead and they're alive. I'm mad because they accepted your message, and I didn't want to hear them. Uh, I didn't want to, to preach it to them in the first place. So yes, I'm mad. But do you do well? Reminded me, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. Because here we have a problem in the heart of the man. In Jonah 4 and Genesis 4, verse 4, verse 7, we see God pointing out the problem of the heart of the man to whom he's speaking. In Genesis chapter 4, we've talked about this before in the, uh, recently. We, we see when Cain and Abel both make their offerings to God and, and we see uh, uh, Abel uh, makes this offering and it's acceptable to God and, and Cain makes an offering and it's not acceptable to God. Um, Cain gets mad. Mad like Jonah. Or Jonah gets mad like Cain. And, and when Cain gets mad, God comes to him and he says, Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? Do you, are, are you doing the right thing, Jonah? Are you doing the right thing, Cain? And, and God tells Cain to, to straighten himself out. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you straighten yourself out, will it not be okay? If you do what's right, will it not be okay? But beware, he tells Cain, sin is crouching at the door, and you have to master it. Watch out, because the devil is stalking like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, to paraphrase from Peter. Think about this. This hatred that Jonah has for the Assyrians, for the city of Nineveh, and for what they do in 721, and eventually they're destroyed about 684, 682-ish by the Babylonians, somewhere around there. And this hatred resonates for hundreds of years, all the way down the line to the time of Jesus, where Jesus turns and he uses the Samaritan as the hero of his story and asking who is your neighbor and Jonah's so upset Jonah's so mad and the people of Jesus' time were so upset and they were so mad about these Samaritans that they couldn't see clearly they couldn't see the value of the other person and look at Jonah chapter 4 in verse 11 where, uh, where God tells Jonah, and should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, that big city, that powerful city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. 120,000 people. And, and you think that maybe is a mid-sized city now. It's not that big, right? But in this day and time, that was, was New York, Chicago, Los Angeles. And these people don't know. They don't understand the, the grace and the mercy and the love of God. But Jonah, you do. And Jonah, you know that God has that grace and that mercy to give, that grace and that mercy to 
And yet here you are not wanting to offer it at all. Having to be forced into offering it. Could God have raised up another prophet that wanted to go? Sure. But was there a point to the lesson that he was trying to teach Jonah and by extension trying to teach us? Yes. And because of that hatred and that animosity that had persisted for hundreds of years, 700 years to the time of Jesus, was Jesus making the Samaritan of whom the Assyrian, for whom the Assyrians were responsible? Is he trying to make the Samaritan the hero of the story to make a point? I think he was. Because when you get right down to it, the Samaritan man, that one man, looked on the Jew who was hurt and laying in the road, that Jewish man. And that one man looked at the other man and he didn't see his enemy. He saw his neighbor. He didn't see somebody who hated him. He saw his neighbor. He saw his fellow traveler in this world as somebody who was in need. And despite those who would have been called this Jewish man's brothers, his brethren, the Levite, the priest, who left him on the side of the road, this Samaritan reached out to him and lifted him up. And, and it kind of makes you wonder, in the story in the parable of the Good Samaritan, who is the oppressed person? Is it the Jew who had the hatred and the animosity toward the Samaritan, but the one who was also left for dead in the road? Or was it the Samaritan who had been, who had been mistreated and, 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 uh, and despised by the Jews, but saw a man who should have been his enemy and acted in, in a compassionate manner? I don't think either one was. I think it was one man, one person, helping another who was in need. What does this mean for us? Well, to kind of go along with everything that we've been talking about the last uh, couple of weeks now, our neighbors are all of God's people. Jonah had to have his arm twisted. Had to be swallowed by that, that sea creature to get him to go to speak to his neighbors. Jesus put that despised man at the center of the parable as the hero. And even this hardcore Jewish scribe, lawyer, recognized that the Samaritan was the neighbor, the hero in that story. Even the people you don't like or society tells you you shouldn't lie. Or, or uh, family history tells you you shouldn't lie. Or cultural differences lead you to not like. Whatever the case might be. All of God's people are our neighbors. And we are all God's creation. The second thing is that we should view every person as created in the image of God. Now, Loosely related. Think about Philemon. Think about Philemon and the letter that Paul wrote to him. And, and Paul wrote Philemon this letter because Onesimus came to him. Now, we don't know the race of Philemon or Onesimus. That's not even discussed. Uh, seemed to have perhaps been Greek. And Paul writes to Philemon and he tells him, Onesimus, the runaway slave, is coming back to him. But Paul tells a Philemon under no, certain, under no uncertainty whatsoever, don't receive him back as, as a fugitive, as a thief, as a runaway slave, as lost property. Because of that class division there. But he tells him to receive him back as a beloved brother. There's a difference there. When you look at somebody and you don't see the exterior, you know, when, 
Saul or Samuel went to choose David as the new king to replace Saul that, that uh, Samuel had it wrong. He wanted the tall brother, David's brother, the, the tall, good-looking guy. And, and uh, God told him, I'm not looking on the outside, I'm looking on the inside. We need to see as God and we need to look at the heart and the soul of a man and not the exterior. Not the color of his skin, not the, where he's from, not what language he speaks, uh, not what culture he grew, grew up in, but we need to see the heart and we need to see the soul and we need to see that that man was created in the image of God. And we need to look upon him as that soul that God created and God put there. And God values and God loves. And when I see something, someone who's been created in the image of God, I must love them because they are my neighbor. And when I love them, I will see that we are all equal in the eyes of God. Christ died for him as much as he died for me. Christ died for her as much as he died for me. And I should treat them that way. Jesus tells us to treat others as we would want to be treated. We call that the golden rule. We're told to love our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, we're taught that we are all equal. We are all one. Not only in the eyes of God, but especially in the blood of Christ. I'm going to close out the lesson today with Galatians chapter 3, verses 25 through 29, because this summarizes where we are at. When we are in Christ. Starting in verse 25, Paul writes, But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now the important part where we're getting at with this lesson. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Not only can we be neighbors, through Christ, we are family. And if we decide that we're going to look upon our brother and we're going to mistreat them, we'll have to answer to the Lord for that. And so who is my neighbor? Who deserves my love? Who am I going to reach out to? Who am I going to treat right? Who am I going to, to carry the gospel to? Uh, not, not in an arrogant or haughty fashion, but as, as a good friend of mine said, I'm just one beggar for telling another beggar where I found bread. Because who is my neighbor? It's my fellow traveler in this world. It, it's the other man that was created in the image of God. It's my brother or sister in Christ. It's, it's the person I don't know or the person I love the most. It's the person that grew up next door to me, uh, following nearly every step by step every aspect of my life, or the person from all the way around me on the other side of the world who has nothing in common with me other than our shared humanity and our salvation in Christ Jesus. I've been blessed enough over my life to be able to know and to meet and to see and interact with people from all across the world, both here in the United States and in their countries as well. And one thing I can say is I have never been anywhere and that people who were in Christ where I was not treated like family. And I owe that to every other person because we're all created in the image of God. I hope that you've been able to gain something from these lessons. Uh, we're going to continue talking about them. We're going to continue for the next few weeks discussing more aspects of what it means for us to love our neighbor. I hope that you're able to, to gain something from this. I hope you're able to, uh, to help enforce and reinforce your love for your neighbor uh, and your love for God, your love for Christ, and your desire to share the gospel to those who are also created in the image of God, but yet who still may be outside of the kingdom.
If you have any spiritual need, please reach out to me. Let me know. I'll help you in any, which, any way I can. Uh, and hopefully together, as fellow travelers in this world, we can let the love of Christ be known to all of our neighbors. Thank you very much. God bless.